Hello, well, we've just come out of the Newsnight studio. It's the five of us, actually, who were there at the end of the programme. We, we're continuing, speaking. We're continuing <laughs> the discussion. It got very, uh, very um, raucous, but we're, we're here. Got some of your questions, and we're going to put them to David Starkey, Tim Montgomery, Kate Williams, and Paris Lees. Just um, not everybody has to answer every question. Keep the questions coming in. Uh, Bryn Swatek says, why does a significant and potentially irreversible decision like this not require a two-thirds majority to pass? Do you think that would be a good idea, Kate, a sort of two-thirds majority for a thing like that? Well, it was very close. I mean, Nigel Farage said if it's 52-48, that's unfinished business uh, on his side. And that's pretty much what we've got, 51.9. So it's very, very close. And essentially, and there's a lot of people didn't turn out, so there's a, you can't say that the Britain has voted overwhelmingly to leave. But would you, would, would you support actually just saying, look, it takes, it takes 65% to, to, to make a move like this? I think... Actually, I would. And I think also what we have to support is to do something as important as this. We need complete honesty and clarity in the campaigns beforehand, because that is one of the problems why I've seen so much voter remorse today. People saying, but I thought we we're going to get this for NHS. I thought it was going to change immigration. I didn't realise the pound was going to plunge. I don't think people really, a lot of under, they, 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 what they're saying is they didn't understand what's going to happen. I'm, I'm willing to bet that our Remain friends will believe that there should have been a two-thirds majority <laughs> requirement, and our Leave thing. friends will say that would be anti-democratic, Tim, would that be? And I think you would be correct <laughs> in that <laughs> prediction. David, no, I wouldn't. Providing the rules are clear beforehand, if you had all of these reservations about you know, um, the need for, for example, very frequently referenda specify what size of turnout you yeah. must have, yeah. then what kind of majority within it. But sorry, the time to do that is before, <laughs> not <laughs> right. afterwards. And frankly, it's a waste of time. Now, I think the fact that it is such a narrow victory, and it will be quite wrong to ignore that fact, um, means it will colour the type of negotiations that take place with Europe. It will obviously colour how politicians behave and speak within Britain. So, in one sense, you've already got what you're asking for. All of these points about the, you know, young having voted differently, about Scotland, about Manchester, except I don't think Manchester's like London at all. Manchester is simply a Potemkin village. Uh, that, you know, ra ra okay, oh, yeah, 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 try, yeah. Try, try not to insult everybody. <laughs> I'm Oldham and Rochester. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Potemkin village, you know. It, it is mm. subs junk it's a great subsidy city, junkie, yeah. yes, yes. Mm. Well, look, let, 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 let's, get, let's take some other. We've got some comments coming in, you know. I mean, shock, says Lima Ahmad. I don't know how this can happen in a country like this. Lima Leaving the EU is like jumping off a lifeboat, says Vivian Stiles, and then trying to get back on under better conditions. Um, but uh, people are beginning to catch on. This is quite interesting to this phrase, Article 50, which I don't think anybody had heard out in the, um, in the, uh, in the real world until, the, until this referendum thing. But someone asks, um, the longer it goes, Steve Greenhalgh, the longer it goes without Article 50 being invoked, does that hint this was just a way of Boris getting the keys to number 10 and we won't actually leave the EU. That's one for you, Tim. Um, I'm getting a bit tired of all the playing against Boris Johnson. You know, I think he had a genuine um, doubt about whether to leave the European Union or not, but he eventually settled. A lot of people, mm. I think, were in that position where they, they weren't sure. Um, but he's been a very disciplined campaigner on this issue now. But there is a real issue, and we've got Matthew Paris writing about this in The Times on, on Saturday, uh, three quarters of the House's, House of Commons does not support leave. Mm -hmm. And so you have a verdict now of the people that is presented to Parliament. And what does Parliament do? Does it completely um, obey the instructions of the British people or does it exercise, or do MPs exercise their own judgment? And are the instructions yeah. of the British Particularly people Particularly as, as parliamentary sovereignty was such a big part of the issue for, for, for many people. the House of Lords as well. I mean, they, they, I mean, legally, obviously legally it's not it's not binding. I mean, no, no government would ignore it. But what's the... I mean, we were very, having a very interesting interview with Jonathan Powell earlier, everyone, when he was saying, oh, well, people say that what Boris was thinking was he just wanted to do this as a way of negotiating and having a second mm -hmm. referendum. I mean, you never know. You never know but certainly he, he, you know, he, he made it pretty clear he, that that was not what, what he wanted what he has i mean what we can say about boris is that he's a man made by referenda including the mayoral referenda mm. that created a, that mayoral referendum and this one can i ask you tim here's a question we know that boris had written two versions of his telegraph article mm. ready to to pull the trigger on when he decided one was for in one was for out should he publish the one that was... <laughs> should he tell us what well, he had written? I would really, really like to see that article. But I think it was 
it's been misrepresented that exercise. This was for him a way of let's see I can make the best case for remain, the best case for leave. And his his explanation for that is when he saw both of the arguments next to each other, he thought the argument right. for leave was well, why much are we superior. Why on Paul Boris? Because well, after all, no, because David Cameron is in exactly the same position. David Cameron comes from the Eurosceptic wing of the Tory Party. David Cameron has been speaking again, you know, in favour of limiting immigration. In other words, he has done a reverse ferret in the course of all of this, in you know, a way every bit as blatant as. We're now suggesting Boris might. And finally, you know, there is no, just one second, there is no way in which this verdict can be ignored by Parliament. Um, we've moved beyond Burke. What Matthew Paris is probably going to invoke is Burke's famous letter to the electors of Bristol saying, you know, I am not your mere delegate, I am a representative. I am there to exercise my brains. I'm afraid the internet the mass electorate have fundamentally changed that relationship. It would be political suicide for any politician to take that line. Yeah. Let's, let's, we've got one here. I'm going to put this one to you, My Paris. Side. Have we been misled? Now, I think you said we have been misled, and I'd, I'd like to hear you explain have that. Have we been misled? I don't, uh, I, I don't think that we're just leaving the EU. I think we're taking leave of our senses. Um, <laughs> what are the lies you think? What, what is it that, that, that you think the Leave campaign did that was actually... I okay. mean, we know the £350 well, million, well, pounds, but that wasn't the thing that really clinched it, probably. OK, so I was, I was back in Nottingham earlier this week and I spoke to uh, a close friend who told me, um, you know, I voted by postal vote for Leave because I think countries should be able to run themselves. But they couldn't give me any example of how Europe had stopped Britain from being able to run itself. Um, and I just think the level of debate public political debate that we've descended to in this country is it actually terrifies me where people are saying oh you know what do experts know I mean with all due respect I don't even know why you guys have been invited here tonight because we seem to have done away with experts in this country and yet at the same time oh we don't like experts but yet David Beckham knows nothing so it's crazy both. but you know we've actually got some really big issues to tackle like climate change that there is a scientific consensus on is a really urgent issue and we're saying oh we just don't believe in experts anymore because so that know, doesn't Paris, <laughs> you can understand why though because you have, you know, it was the Queen's question to the economists, remember? She said, None of you predicted the crash. You know, oh, but Tim, Tim, the... Tim, I'm going to argue with you. To often get things wrong doesn't mean that they have a, a better batting you, you average. You have, have, have to live in this country too, and their children do. They do no give one, the no best isn't. advice that, that, that they, they, sorry, we all have to live in this country. All these experts can communicate with people in language that they understand and which they care about, they will be disregarded and they will be correctly disregarded. The, the trouble is that we have had, and I'm afraid the, the result exposes this sh with shattering clarity, we've had a conspiracy um, of elites. This is a reaction against elites. We've had a conspiracy of elites that have really run politics. There's the most revealing remark in the last 24 hours has come from Brussels, which is one absolutely affronted diplomat which said, this was far too important a question to let the people decide. And unfortunately... Alistair Campbell said that with, with me on BBC News. A lot of people Alistair have said Campbell that. Alistair Campbell practised that. Okay. Yeah. And, but that, but that. And, and, so you were talking about deceit. Well, perhaps you would tell me when we have had an honest political campaign. But perhaps, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, enough. Your question perhaps, has been put. Your question has been put. Kate, 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 Kate. But, you, but uh, earlier, Evan, you were talking. You were talking to Daniel Hannan, and you said, what about this immigration promise? And I think a huge amount of people vote and with the West Midlands where I'm from immigration was a key question they they believed it was going to be limited and as you as you were discussing that's simply not the case so to me that seems like oh, no, he, a said, of he said line. clearly that it would be limited he said that the rules would change he said that they will be enforced differently and that leaving the EU will enable one to do precisely that I mean again you know, the question of immigration there is that famous leak about the Blair government, that people's noses were going to be rubbed in cultural diversity by deliberately increasing okay. immigration. Okay. And so that seems to be true. And you know, if you're to understand the degrees of resentment, the degrees of contempt, and again, it's sort of part of a very long story. Uh, this goes back 
too uh, clearly the expenses scandal. Um, Indeed, in the financial well, crisis. Well, well, I don't but David, you're as a, as a historian, I don't understand why you're not drawing parallels between other times where society has been split. We've got an ever widening gap between the rich and the poor, That's and right. when that happens, I'm extremism, extremism takes. David, David, takes extremism flourishes when society is unequal. What is this if not extremism? This is a completely radical act to lead the European. No one's ever done this before. Okay, I'm going to just. I'm going to break in because I want us to have a slightly quick fire round here, okay? Um, just because I want to get through more questions. <laughs> no, no. Okay, this one's from Michael Sercom. This is for you, um, Tim. Has George Osborne completely gone to ground? Yes, where is he? I uh, have no idea. He's, He's probably going to lay down a dog room for six Right. <laughs> um, Will Ashfield says, I think this is aimed at you too. Why can't people, and he shouts it in capital, why can't people just accept the result of the vote? Because Farage said that he wouldn't accept it if the results had been the same but the other way around. And <laughs> also, I think it's that it, we have, I mean, there are many elections I've been very unhappy about, but this one, you see so many people saying, but I didn't vote for this, this is what I expected, and I expected they were, they, they believed. They and we don't get to change it in four years' different. time. Um, Someone, Opal Donna says we need a new referendum. That, I suppose, is why can't we just accept the results so of the vote? Someone else is. Is that a new yeah. commission? They generally <laughs> like us to vote again if we get I'll the get out on the streets and canvas Okay, look, here's, here's an interesting, a slightly specific one. I'm going to give it to you, David, but I want this is quick fire, so nice and short. Tony Baker says, can the EU force us to leave earlier than we want? So basically, we're obviously stringing it out a bit. Can they force us to leave? Uh, My understanding that. is not. In other words, Article 50, I read it this morning, it is clear it is invoked by the leaving party. And I think any attempt, as it were, twisting that, we could go, di if we wanted to, we could go directly to the European Court and it would, I think, be bound to rule in our favour, legally. Mm. But I think if we want a good relationship with Europe, we need to try and work with them as to the timing. So the fact that they're saying, we want you to do it now, means we've got to listen to them. Because if we want some kind of negotiation at the table, we have to pay attention to what they're asking for. Let me, let me just ask a, um, uh, one here. This is, and I'd be interested in your comments on this. It's basically, it's one referring to e how the EU will treat UK nationals on the continent. And I would just add how we treat EU nationals here, uh, as I'm married to one that quite, quite, matters quite a bit but what's the what is the um what is going to happen i mean do we think that there is any chance at all that people who are already resident in one eu country will be well it'd serve us right wouldn't it if they did get rid of us my granddad lives in spain um so god knows what's What's going to happen to him? Um, yes, I was, just, I was just in Spain the other week and talking to so many people there and they're terrified about their pensions plunging, about their house prices plunging. They, are, they were absolutely keen Remainers, mm -hmm. but obviously not very many of them. They were interviewing some of them on the news last night, but you're absolutely right. They are, they are in more uncertainty than well, we look are. Look at what we've got. We've got doubt, uncertainty, fear, paranoia, confusion. It's just a complete mess. Tim, what do you think should happen to the many Poles, the many... French, German, Spanish, Portuguese, everybody. What do you think mm. should happen to the ones here? I think we should accept that people who are already here are already here and they're welcome, they're making a contribution. Right. I think and what have about reciprocal the ones, right. What but, about the ones who arrive in the next two months? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how many people will arrive. Well, it arrive could be quite a lot the, if you hear may, what you're... There may be large numbers, but uh, I think you have to accept that people who've come under an existing jurisdiction their rights and privileges need to be respected. I think the difficult area is the one you absolutely spotlight. What happens now between the vote yeah, and the leaving? Yeah. David, go on, you've got an answer. Except presumably, uh, because we've heard that this country is going to down, down the tubes, all young people will be terrified, instantly immigration to Britain will stop. Um, you can just imagine it, can't you? Nobody will ever want to come here again. We'll have no need for a border force because well, clearly, I don't, you should clearly know people no, weren't come always on, so keen try and, to be try here. Surely you must remember the 70s when it was try horrible. Try and cope with a joke and try right. and answer <laughs> let, it. Yeah, let, let, let's go to Sorry, another I one. I just thought you were no. being super silly. <laughs> it is hard to tell sometimes, David. you two should have a let, show. Let, <laughs> <laughs> I think that like a joke. <laughs> let me... Boring, let me <laughs> Let me ask another one, because this is, this is an interesting one. This is Tony Trent expresses this fear. His fear is the rise of the far right. Once people realise that leaving the EU wasn't the magic bullet and that, in fact, it might even make things worse. I wonder whether 
this is, if you like, something that would lead to people saying we've been taken by right-wingers yeah. off the wrong path if they find they regret, have voter remorse, or would they say we need to go one other step to the right to get, you know, satisfaction and um, better, better action against immigrants or well, whatever? Well, the, the fact is we, we've got two types of politicians, ones that bring people together like Joe Cox and ones that push people apart. And what you've got with Trump and what you've got with Farage and his friends, they're dividing people. We're not closer as a people. There is not more love in the world now. There is more discord and, and people turning against each other. And it's, it's genuinely scary. And we yeah. do have to guard against this. You should know this better than anybody, that when people start to turn against each other, it can escalate and become very ugly very quickly. And we should always be looking for ways to come together, to be more unified, and to not take the peace that we fought so hard for to be taken for granted. That was, why you were, that was why you were denouncing the elderly, was it? In such very intemperate terms. To she bring wasn't. people... Yes, you were. You were describing them as no, being no, self... David, no, 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 David. I, I David, think David, the don't generation make above my, my parents' generation have been incredibly selfish and voted against the interests of the young. And my, my friends... Um, wife is 80 and she said she she wasn't sure which way to vote but she voted for the ways of the what what the young wanted because ultimately they're the people who are going to have it's, to live with that decision this is childish but it's really it interesting it's really well, interesting no it's not childish it's childish. childish it's childish that our grandparents seem to care more uh, well, hate seem to hate yeah. immigrants more than they okay love their the mic the microphone determines who's actually heard yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think the real cause of extremism in europe Aren't the people like Nigel Farage who, you know, I won't defend that poster, how can that you refugees deny, how do you poster. Deny that this can I? Be whipping I, thought, I thought you were against. I thought you were against come, interrupting come, come, people come, before no, they no, hardly started making that point. Yeah. The real cause of extremism in Europe is this pursuit of the political project called the Euro, which has created mass youth unemployment, fifty percent rates in Spain, in Portugal, in Italy, and Greece. Austerity bad? way beyond that's necessary. A European central bank that obsesses over inflation rather than unemployment. It's these institutional mechanisms of this institution that you love. What it has done for young people across the continent. That's why a lot of us, look, you know, I respect the moral power that you have in wanting to stay, but there's a moral power that a lot of us feel, and a lot of moral anger at what the EU has created as well. well can I ask you that? I do you honestly, in all faith, now, sorry, in all faith, do you, do you honestly believe that the Leave campaign hasn't whipped up paranoia, fear, uh, hatred okay. against foreigners. Good question. Good Zenophobia. question. Look, Tim. I don't think the Leave campaign has been edifying in, in every sense. I think there's a distinction, of course, between the one led by Boris and the one led by Farage. But you know, the, look at the other side of the campaign as well. When did you hear a positive case for the EU made by the Remain campaign? It was all about bombs under the economy. It was about That's World what we're War Three. We're talking about the no, I'm ta we're talking about negative. Okay, well, I'm, you gonna, are. I'm talking about that poster that Farage was in front of, which wouldn't be so bad if he wasn't there triumphant. Which I will not defend. Today, which smiling I will and laughing. Not defend. Is but this okay now? Is this being okay, I'm going to just, I just, I'm just going to, I'm going to interrupt because it's actually getting up to midnight, and I, I, I want to draw this to a close and go home. <laughs> we have to leave. However. I wanted, I wanted to give the last word to David Starkey. I'd never thought I'd say that, but I want to give the last word to David because, David, Paris said something very interesting. It was a sort of appeal to the spirit of peace and reconciliation and spreading love and friendship. And, I mean, I, I, I can see you scoffing already, but I, I, there is something in that. There are people who are very good at that, and there are people who do basically spread fear. Do you recognise that? Do you agree with Paris that is our politics will be better with a, a little more love and a little less hate. Yes, but then, of course, the love has got to come in both directions because precisely what has happened is that the kind of politics that she espouses has produced hatred and division. No, it hasn't. <laughs> of course it hasn't. <laughs> David, David good on true. you, but you can't win in, the, in an argument against the young in the long term, is okay. all I can say. Look, I think this, is a, this has been a very spirited and entertaining discussion. Our editor, Ian Katz, is actually sitting... He was. He was going to join in this, He's but he came in late, and he, he, um, I really, I didn't think he was going to get a word in ed ed edgeways. We had a cast of um, too many gobby people already. So anyway, look, have a very good a very night. Chairman. Have a very good night, and uh, thank you all uh, for watching and for your questions. And I'm sorry we didn't get through more. Thanks.